You know, around here we, we uh, don't talk a whole lot about the Ten Commandments like obey the Ten Commandments. We don't say that a whole bunch or emphasize that a whole bunch because the New Testament didn't emphasize that a whole bunch. Right. It emphasized a lot of the commands. It just didn't say obey the Ten Commandments. And I think there's a special reason why we're going to study that tonight. So we've been through nine of the Ten Commands. And the truth is we've been through all nine of the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to keep today. That's right. Only nine of the Ten Commandments passed through into the New Testament. One of them got left behind. And that's okay. So we're going to prove that tonight so everybody's comfortable with it. Because I say it quite a bit just to keep you alive and fresh, recognizing the big transition between Old Testament and New Testament. And so we're going to prove that all out by Scripture today. Are you ready? Yes. All right, Father, in Jesus' name, we open the Word of God. We ask for revelation, knowledge, spirit of wisdom. We want to see clearly. We want to know things, Father. So impart the truth of heaven to us. Let the Word of God come alive to us. Assimilate all these spiritual realities inside of us so that we can live a healthy, full, Holy Spirit-filled life in Christ Jesus. Do that for everybody in the building, everybody in church tonight. Just bless them, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're studying the fourth commandment tonight. The fourth commandment, which is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now... Through history of the church, even the spirit-filled church, there's been a little misunderstanding there. Even some of our great preachers that we quote and love so dearly from the past didn't quite teach it the way that I think it ought to be taught, the way that I think the New Testament lays it out for us. So they kind of hammered on, you know, keep the Sabbath. Now, what does keep the Sabbath mean to us? Well, it's kind of, kind of difficult, and it differs from person to person, church to church, denomination to denomination. What does it really mean if you were going to try to keep the Sabbath? So it's a, it's a, little, mis, a little, little confusing anyway, because the New Testament doesn't lay it out. You would have to go back to the Old Testament to find out what remember the Sabbath and keep it holy actually means. And since we don't do that much in church, nobody really knows what it means. And so what I found when I first got in the Lord and started walking with God, I realized, wait a second, Worshiping God on a special day, is that important? We're picking the right day, is that important? And so then I began to study and learn some of these things. And so that's why I think it's important for every Christian, especially new Christians, to, to figure this out so that as you go through your Christian walk, you're not blindsided by somebody that comes up and starts condemning you for worshiping God on Sunday rather than Saturday or doing some extra on a Sunday that they don't think you ought to be doing and all those type things. So let's get to the Word of God and then we'll uh, see some things. It'll be clear. You'll be happy about it. And if you still have any arguments about it, see Patrick. He can answer all your questions. <laughs> all right. Exodus chapter 31, we'll start there. We won't go through the rest of the 10 as a summer. We've done that several weeks already. Of course, you shall have no other gods before him, no graven images, no murdering, no stealing, no killing, no coveting, all that. So you know the rest of the commands, um, or maybe you don't. Actually, most of you probably couldn't, most of you probably couldn't list the 10 commandments, could you? You'd need a committee. Now, if three or four of you got together, you could figure them all out, right? Remember them all. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because those stone tablets are not our guide for life. Right. Amen. Those stone tablets are a moral guide for people that don't have God inside them. So that's where we start seeing the real change here from Old Testament to New Testament. God said, I'm going to take all these words that I had to write in a book and write on stone. I'm going to put them right in your heart. So we don't have to go through life, looking at the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, what can I do? Oh, I can't, oh, I can't commit adultery. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we've got stuff in our heart. We've got the commands in our heart. We don't even want to. We right. know by the Spirit of God right. not to. So the first premise here, well, let me just read the commands so you'll be clear on it, and then we'll, we'll move along. Exodus 31, are you there? It says this, You shall keep the Sabbath... Therefore, for it is holy to you, everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does, does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. 
Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Now if you just stop there, it seems pretty clear. Seems pretty clear. But there's a whole lot of words after this in the Bible. Isn't there? And so you have to recognize a lot of things about the Old Covenant. One of the main things, we've already kind of studied that, the main thing is that out of the Old Covenant which was a perpetual, everlasting covenant, God said, I'm going to make a new covenant and make this old covenant obsolete. Amen. God decided that. We didn't decide that. God decided, I'm going to take this old covenant out of it. It's going to spring a new one that I hope they follow because I'm making the old one obsolete and, and not even usable anymore. And that's part of the perpetual covenant that a new one's coming. So that's how the old covenant stays perpetual is that it's changed into a new covenant. We're driving down the road in an old jalopy and it's like transformers. And it's a whole new, it's a whole new thing. The old thing is gone, new thing. Amen. We'll prove that out. It's all in scripture. It's all clear if you read the Old Testament with New Testament glasses on. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Well, uh, let me just, let me identify a couple things. Number one, it says, you'll die if you profane the Sabbath. And, and if you look in the detail of the Old Testament, do you remember what profaning the Sabbath would be? Or what keeping the Sabbath requires? Number one, it requires no work. Remember the guy in Numbers that was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day and they stoned him because he violated the law. Have you ever worked on Sunday? Have you, ever picked, have you ever made a campfire on Sunday? Have you ever cut the grass on Sunday? But we didn't kill you because the law has been ended. Make sense? Now here's what you have to recognize with the commands. Nine of the ten commands that we keep are moral commands. The one that we don't keep, remember the Sabbath, is not a moral command. It doesn't affect people. It's a ceremonial command. You understand? We have moral laws and then we have ceremonial laws all throughout the Old Testament. We're required to keep the moral laws in the New Testament. They, all the moral laws pass right through. How we treat our neighbor, all that passes right through. The ceremonial laws that were for only the Jews do not pass through. So we see that you put to death. And then uh, notice also it says, Verse 16, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It doesn't say the Christians or the Gentiles or the non-Jews. It's just the Jews. It was just for that time for that people. All right. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 14 or verse uh, 12. Deuteronomy 5.12, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who's within your gates. Notice that term. This, the, the Sabbath law was confined to the gates of the nation. We don't, we don't have gates, do we? We couldn't control this if we had to. We can't stop our neighbor from doing anything. We can't stop any, anybody from doing anything. If you were going to try to keep the Sabbath holy and not do any work, it also requires that you don't make anybody else work on the Sabbath. Isn't that right? And so we've said before, it's very clear, that that means you cannot try to obey the Sabbath and sit at home on Saturday or Sunday and try not to work, try not to move too fast, and order pizza. <laughs> you would be causing someone else to violate the Sabbath law. Matter of fact, you couldn't even turn the television on. Because those people are working. Or you couldn't watch any live programming. So you start examining it this way. It's like, oh yeah, that didn't make any sense at all, does it? It doesn't because this was confined to a nation that had gates, that had control, that had theocracy. So nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger within your gates that, 
that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from here by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Notice, what, there's two reasons to keep the Sabbath. One is you need some rest. Two is, is to remember that you came out of Egypt. None of you did. You couldn't remember about coming out of Egypt. You were never there. We were delivered from spiritual Egypt, not natural Egypt. And that's why this whole thing of the Sabbath command is a type and shadow of what we now have in Christ. We're going to prove all that out. This Old Testament law and the Old Testament Sabbath command was simply a foretelling, a shadow, a type, a symbol of what was to come. Once the thing comes, we don't need the shadow. You understand? Uh, the shadow kind of gives you a shape, kind of gives you a form of maybe what I look like, but doesn't have any of my facial features. You can't see enough by a shadow. And that's why the Old Testament was quite dark and quite mysterious to, to everybody. And why so many missed the Messiah in the first place is because the Old Testament didn't give the full deal. It's like just getting a sniff of the food and not getting to eat it. Just seeing a shadow, but not getting to see the real person. Matter of fact, if you ask me to come over to your house, you really don't even care if I bring my shadow. You just want me. Isn't that right? That's how we are now with the, with the New Testament. We, we just want Christ. Once I got Christ, I don't really need any of that other stuff. I don't need the traditions. I don't need the feasts. I don't need any of the, the garb. I don't need anything. I, once I got Jesus in me, I'm, I'm complete. I'm secure. Once I have the Holy Spirit in me, I can take a big sigh of relief from religion. Lord. Once I get the Holy Spirit, I can, I can breathe freely for the first time in my life. Amen. Even the re Orthodox religious people can, once they get saved, all of a sudden they realize all this stuff I was trying to do. Oh, all the burden's gone. Amen. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. So you start seeing the value. Once you recognize the, the, the burden that the law put on the nation of Israel, the schoolmaster, the tutor, once you realize what Christ did for us, it's so freeing. That's why Paul could go from one day to the next. One day he's killing Christians, the next day he's preaching Christ. Full of joy, full of, full of life, full of glory, full of peace, full of righteousness. Mm. Without all that history. That's why he could say, you know, I count all my history as dung. I count all my religious upbringing as nothing, rubbish. And I was, the, I, was the, I was the Jew of all Jews. I was the Pharisee. I was the tribe of Benjamin. I, I had been trained above all my peers. He said, I, I'll throw all that out because I got Jesus. Lord. Glory. So you'll find some that want to argue whether the Jewish Sabbath is on a Saturday or a Sunday. So they kind of complain. Some people complain that we Christians sell, uh, worship God together on Sunday. Uh, and I, I don't really have to go there. The Jewish calendar is different. Sure, the Jewish, uh, Jewish Sabbath is Saturday. There's no argument there. Okay, fine. Jewish Sabbath is Saturday. 24 hours, Friday night to Saturday night. That's not really an argument we need to be in. All right? So, <clears throat> let me say this as a disclaimer. I do, as a Christian, recognize the value in taking a day off. Okay? So if, if you're kind of stuck there, yeah, I kind of agree that we ought to have a day off. It's good for the soul to be inactive, to have some recreation, to do some hobbies. Uh, I do agree that it's probably physically good for you to take some time off. All right. I'm all for that. At the same time, you don't have to have 24 hours at a time necessarily. You can if you want to. But I do kind of believe in, in, in having rest in your life. Sure. But when we talk about spiritual rest, we can have spiritual rest all the time. Yeah. Notice the Sabbath for them was required after they had worked real hard to then rest on purpose. But Jesus has become our rest. Once we receive Jesus, we're at rest. We're at peace in our heart. And that's why we preach so hard that at work all week long, you can be happy and peaceful. You don't have to be you know, strung out all, all week at, at work. 
you know, and Friday and Saturday come, you just beat to, you know, to shreds, and then you kind of stroll into church needing, needing something to, to, you know, a little shot in the arm or something. I think you can pray in tongues and stay in the Bible all week long, be spiritually fit all week long, be, be joyful and, and uh, a good witness at work all week long. Yeah. Amen. If, you, if you live a principled life, you can do that. Glory. Uh, trying to force the church to uh, celebrate the Sabbath or, or honor the Sabbath would be kind of like forcing France to celebrate the July 4th. We, were, we, we didn't get out of Egypt, so we don't have to pick a day to celebrate that. Does that make sense? Yes. The word Sabbath, some people think it means seventh. It doesn't mean seventh. I guess it starts with an S, they think seven. The word Sabbath actually means to cease or to rest, simply that. And to, to get a day of rest, you had to work six days. So that doesn't even work with our culture, because our first day of the week is our day off. Just playing. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, they had a day that they honored God especially, that they remembered covenant especially. We remember covenant every day. We take communion anytime we want to. We acknowledge God and honor God and worship God all the time. We choose Sunday to get together and do it. We choose Wednesday to get together and do it. We choose every other day to honor God and worship God and have fun together. Isn't that right? Yes. So that just way, way more than just waiting for one day to honor God. Right. Picking, picking some particular day to honor God doesn't do anything for God. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need that. Matter of fact, he said in the Bible, he said the Sabbath was not made for, it was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It was not designed so that we could honor some day and, and produce some sort of uh, merit with God. Mm -hmm. It was given to us just so we can have a day of rest. Before the Spirit came in. Now the Spirit's in us and we just have total rest. Amen. I know I need to read a bunch of Scripture to corroborate this, but we'll get there. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Amen. Turn to Colossians chapter 2 with me. Or no, let's, uh, let's go to Hebrews 3. We'll read this passage first and then we'll move along. One reason that we have to cover this, and uh, we've done it many different ways a lot quicker than this. This is a whole meeting on the Sabbath day. But one reason we do this is so that Christians don't ever have a subtle hint of condemnation in their heart. Like, I had to go to work on Sunday. Is that okay? My boss called me in. Is that okay? Or should I have told him no? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a normal reaction from a, from a new Christian, you see, who's been told that that's one of the commands, keep the Sabbath holy. The law of keep the Sabbath holy meant you couldn't work. It meant that you couldn't even travel more than about a mile. So every Sunday, most of you violate the Sabbath by coming to church. <laughs> Make sense? And then, then what happens is some people decide, you know what? Uh, but we keep the Sabbath this way. And we just decide we're not working. So we're keeping the Sabbath by we don't go to work. We refuse to work. But you can do hobby work. And you can mow your grass because that's good. And we can go to church even though we're traveling too far. So they're, now they're changing the Sabbath rules. Making up their own rules. To try to feel good about themselves fulfilling some obligation to the fourth command. Which I say there is none of that in the New Testament. Amen. Not, even a, not even a hint of encouragement for anybody to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. You realize that? I want to prove it out to you. Just hang in there. Not even a hint of encouragement for anybody, Jew or Gentile, to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. Not even a hint of it. This is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like squishing wrong doctrine. I mean, you know that. Yes. Yeah. And then the reason is clear. It's because Christians get in bondage. Legalism will stifle the life of God out of us. How does it do that? It puts a burden that you can't fulfill. It puts a command that you can never do. That's what the, that's what the law was all about. It was putting a law on you that no one could fifth fulfill. So everybody lived with guilt. Jesus comes, His blood is shed to clean you from all your guilt. To make you righteous without all that stuff. 
So you don't have to go through life, you know, with, with a ball and chain on your leg. Legalism makes people feel guilty for what stuff they shouldn't even have to. Churches for years have been making people feel guilty uh, the way they wear the hair, their makeup, their, their clothes and all that. And all that stuff just leads to bondage. It's not life-giving. You can't serve God joyfully if you're stuck in bondage. Where did I tell you to turn to? Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. So this, this is uh, describing the Jews entering the promised land. Some of them didn't believe. They were scared of the giants. They didn't believe God in face of the giants. And so God said that they had an evil heart of unbelief. Remember that? That's in verse 12. But look at verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in into what? Into the promised land. Because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word that they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Amen. So the way that we get into rest is we don't wait for the calendar to switch to Saturday or Sunday. We believe and we get into that rest. It's the rest of the soul. It's the spirit man being at peace with God. So I swore in my wrath, God said, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all His works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those who to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. What's he referring to here? It was first preached to the Jews. They did not enter that rest because of unbelief. One translation says unbelief instead of the word disobedience. It's the same exact Greek word. So he's talking about their unbelief. That's how he started and that's how he's continuing. Again, he designates a certain day saying today after a long time, it's been said today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, that'd be going in the promised land, he would have not afterwards spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Stop there. You see that and it's like, okay, well that means, see, we're supposed to cease from our works. No, he's talking about your works for righteousness. He's not talking about your work during the week. It's all spiritual now. He's talking about people working for righteousness. If you have believed, you enter rest and you cease from your working for righteousness. But if you read this with one eye open, it'll be, you'll stop there and say, see, God rested from his work. You're supposed to, it was all a symbol. Verse 11, therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience or unbelief. Stop there. Now, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. So we're entering into rest by believing. Colossians 2, it's in there somewhere. Are you ready? Yes. Colossians 2, verse, four, uh, verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements or ordinances that was against us. That's a good scripture to remember for later, maybe. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. King James says ordinances. All the laws, commands were wrapped up into this. Ordinances, requirements. Wiped out the handwriting that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. 
So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Notice, they're a shadow of what we now have in Christ. Don't let anybody judge you in that. And I'll say it both ways. Don't judge someone that does it and don't judge someone that doesn't. If you like your festival days, fine. If you like your feast days, fine. If you like to do something different on the Sabbath, fine. But don't put that as a command on anybody else. Now, if, if, you're get, if you're feeling condemned over what you're trying to do and failing, then, then as a Christian, I want to try to help you if you won't help. But if you don't want help, I won't judge you. <laughs> Make sense? And that's why Jesus didn't go around saying, stop keeping the Sabbath. That's why the apostles didn't go around saying, stop keeping the Sabbath. All they said was receive Christ. Get freed from your old self. Lord. Look at Romans chapter 5. It gets better. We're just kind of revving up here. It gets better. Man, that's good. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Did I say 5? <laughs> 14. Verse 5. Ah. Actually, we're going to read verse um, Romans 14, verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute doubtful things. Okay, let me stop there. This, the rest of this passage is, is about the stumbling block aspect of Christianity. Meaning, if someone thinks it's a sin, let's not do it in front of them so we don't cause them to stumble. Make sense? Now, he does say that some people are weak in the faith. Maybe it's a new believer. Maybe it's someone has been trained wrong, someone that's not thinking right. For whatever reason, some people are weak in the faith and so they don't understand things. Let's not argue with them. Let's teach them and, and help them if they're, if they're open. But recognize that while they're weak in the faith, we need to be careful. Make sense? So if I was to meet a Seventh-day Adventist who certainly believed the Sabbath is the main command of the whole Bible, basically, then I have to be tender how I handle this. I want, to, I want to lead them to Christ, make sure they're saved, and then, you know, slowly and gently maybe teach them if they want to learn or share it. Just let's rejoice about being in Christ together. That's fine. Let's not, I don't need to argue with somebody weak in the faith. Now, if they're trying to hammer, like one time I had a Seventh-day Adventist trying to turn a new Christian back to the Old Testament. And I stepped in and, 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 and stopped it. I've done that many times with people. Now, well, you hold on a second. You're wrong. You stop trying to persuade them that you're wrong. <laughs> but if it's just me and the person, then I'm obligated just to walk in love and be real tender with them. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if they're trying to turn somebody else, remember what Paul did. Somebody was trying to turn the deputy from the faith and he blinded the guy. Now, I haven't done that. <laughs> but when an innocent one is being affected, then we step in and stop it. Remember, Jesus even said that. He said, if you were to offend a little one, it's better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you cast into the sea right. than to offend one of these little ones. Yes, right. And you'll see in the Bible where Jesus and Paul and everybody else, they'll step in and be real strict whenever somebody else is getting hurt. Amen. So when it comes to wrong doctrine, misleading people, that's when I like to step in. Amen. Amen. But if it's just the person, well, we, we're tender with it. They might be weak in the faith. Verse 2, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge, judge, judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he'll be made to stand, for God's able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be con fully convinced in his own mind. Make sense? Some people really like Christmas. That's their favorite day of the whole year. Other people, it's just another day. You can do what you want to do is what he's saying. Verse 6, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, 
For he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. So this means that if you do like Christmas, you can't get on somebody and say, this is Jesus' birthday, and you should be celebrating it better. <laughs> right? It goes both ways, doesn't it? Verse 7, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. 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 Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, to the right about 20 pages. Galatians chapter 4, <coughs> verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. Stop there. Notice observing days and months and seasons and years. Another scripture you have includes the word Sabbaths in there. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 23, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do which is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? And those, was, those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to him, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Notice how in Jesus' ministry, remember what he was doing, he was transitioning from the Old to the New Testament. He was ministering and living under the law, yet alluding to the big change that was coming at the cross of Christ. And so Jesus takes an Old Testament example. How obscure takes an Old Testament example showing how they broke the Sabbath back then. How they broke the law back then because they needed to. Isn't that right? The, the whole thing is not about keeping law. It's about living under God. It's not about keeping law. It's about walking in love. And so Jesus broke the Sabbath many times. He labored on the Sabbath day many times. Basically breaking the thing. Now we know didn't, Jesus didn't violate anything. He kept the entire law. So he's showing us that that's not even part of the requirements anymore. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Did everybody buy it? Yes. 
Good. They got mad too. They got mad because he was working on the Sabbath, doing things. And Jesus said, you know, can't we do some good things on the Sabbath? In the Old Testament, you couldn't do good things on the Sabbath. You couldn't build a bonfire. You couldn't roast marshmallows on the Sabbath day. I mean, that's what the guy was doing. He's picking up sticks to make a fire. No, I don't know why he was picking up sticks. <laughs> Jesus said he's Lord of the Son of Man. Notice he said the Son of Man. Now, we've taught on this before. You realize that Jesus is our example. He's our pattern. He's, he's the, our brother. He's the forerunner. He's the firstborn. We're the secondborn. He's, a, he's the begotten son. We are the ado adopted sons. He has a ministry, we have a ministry. He had the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. He had a commission, we have a commission. He had power, we have power. Right? And so, Jesus was showing us how to live as Christians. And so many times the, the scripture will say the Son of God did such and such. Other times it says the Son of Man. Showing us that He was all God and all man. Also giving us a pattern as a man. So if Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath and He's in me, then we're Lord of the Sabbath. That means we get to decide what we do on the Sabbath. Amen. You remember in John 4, Jesus met the woman at the well. And she was a little concerned. She, she brought up a spiritual question after she recognized He was a prophet. She brought up this spiritual question, which was actually quite carnal, but yet it was a good question, I think. She said, now the Jews say we ought to worship here and everybody else says we ought to worship there. Jesus said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. Jesus changed even the Jewish form of worship. It's not about here or there. It's not about how you do it. It's not about your form. <laughs> it's not about traditions, structures. None of that's important anymore. It's freeing. I mean, to think about it, if you were a Jew back then and all of a sudden Jesus set you free and you, your heart's all of a sudden full of God, just think about it. Now, actually... We're really no different than them, and they're, they're no different than us. The early saints had the same stuff to deal with as we. If you recall, even, in the, even back then, when they found out Gentiles were getting saved, they had to send delegates to the council in Jerusalem to ask the apostles, what do we do? What do we tell these Gentiles who are getting filled with the Spirit? Uh, shouldn't we tell them to get circumcised? Don't they have to follow the, the law of Moses? I mean, it's, a, it's a great that they believe in Jesus, but they'd be a lot better if they'd follow the law of Moses too. And that's where we find so many today that it's great to be saved, but you also have to, have to what? It's great to believe in Christ, but then you also have to, what? You're a great Christian because you got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. You'd be a better Christian if you'd stay home on Sunday. Saturday, excuse me, Saturday. <laughs> this is the insinuation of, and, and this is what taints real righteousness. Real righteousness is total security between you and God because of your faith in Jesus alone. Your life of obedience is a subsequent matter. Your life of obedience is part of it. And walking with God is important. And your fellowship with the Spirit is important. But it doesn't determine your righteousness doesn't make you any better. You're, you're as good as you're going to get in the eyes of God. Glory. Now we know you have some sanctification to do on, your, on yourself. Amen. But as far as God's concerned, you're in Christ and He looks at you and He says, man, all I can see is Jesus, so come on. Even if you've mowed your yard on Sunday. Okay, let me, let me run through some of the, some statistics for you, okay? Um, like I said in the beginning, 
the New, Testa the New Testament has no command of keep the Sabbath holy. Not one time in the New Testament does it ever say, remember the Sabbath. Never does it say, keep the Sabbath holy. Uh, never is it insinuated to remind people about the Sabbath. Never does it say, remember the fourth commandment. Paul didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. Peter didn't do it. Jude didn't do it. John didn't do it. Amen. None of them. So no believer has ever been commanded ever to keep the Sabbath holy. No Gentile either has ever been commanded to keep the Sabbath holy. However, in the New Testament, the command against adultery is in there 31 times. Hey. The command against false witnessing or lying is in there 11 times. The command to not covet is in there 18 times. The command to not murder is in there 13 times in the New Testament. The command to honor your father and mother is at least eight reminders in the New Testament. Stealing is reminded not to do it 11 times in the New Testament. Taking the Lord's name in vain or blasphemy, 15 reminders in the New Testament. Serve no other gods or idolatries in there 28 times in the New Testament. Keep the Sabbath zero times in the New Testament. Now all those counts except for the Sabbath one of zero, uh, maybe there's one or two that I missed. Now the word Sabbath is found in the New Testament. Let me say this. The word Sabbath or Sabbaths is mentioned 110 times in the Old Covenant. It's mentioned 50 times in the ministry of Jesus. Never to keep it, but it's mentioned. And it's, it's mentioned only 10 times in the New Testament. Out of the 10 times the Sabbath is mentioned in the New Testament... Never once are Gentiles encouraged to keep it. So out of the 170 instances of the word Sabbath, zero of them command that Gentiles keep it. The time it is mentioned in the New Testament always and only has to do with the Jews meeting in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That's all it mentioned, the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Paul went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and disputed with the Jews and the Gentiles. The only time it's mentioned is because the Jews of that day were still meeting on the Sabbath day. And they still can meet today on the Sabbath day. They're just not required to keep it as a law. They may think they are, but they're not required to keep it as law today. It's doing them no good. You believe that? Some people think that the Jews can still live under their Old Testament, their Old Covenant, and still get some favor from God if they try to do it pretty well. Well, first of all, they, they can't do it perfectly. If they offend in one point, they offend in all points. And, and if they offend in one point, they offend in all points, then they must sacrifice animals in order to be accepted by God under Old Testament rule. And they are not sacrificing any more animals. Now, if you ever talk to them about it, they're like, yeah, well, we changed that. The rabbis changed that years ago. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. Just changing God's word at will. Why? Because they don't believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you have a blood sacrifice for the rest of your life. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank Thank you, Lord. Lord. But trying to rearrange, you know, how it might fit your little lifestyle or your little religion is not, is not good enough for God. I'll run through them real quick. In, um, Paul is preaching to the Jews in the synagogues of Antioch and Pisidia, Acts chapter 13. And then in Iconium, Acts chapter 14, says the synagogue of the Jews on the Sabbath. Thessalonica in chapter 17. Uh, in Corinth in chapter 18. So you'll see that ten times it's mentioned, the word Sabbath is mentioned, but it's never to command us to keep it. It just, you know, you got to say some of these things because Christians and preachers have spent hours upon hours, years upon years, trying to determine which day is the proper day for us to keep the Sabbath holy. Based on the Jewish calendar and the time and all that stuff. And it's just, it's, it's so rigorous and it's such bondage. It brings no life to anybody. And, at, you know, you're studying for three weeks and all these sinners are passing you by. 
that you could have witnessed to. <laughs> oh, I mentioned Acts chapter 15 where the early, the early uh, Gentiles were getting saved and the, they sent counsel over to the Jews to say, hey, what do we tell these Gentiles? You know, shouldn't they get circumcised, keep the law of Moses? And they, they, they got together and had a meeting and the apostles filled with the Holy Spirit decided certain things. Now that had been a good time to tell them to keep the Sabbath holy because Gentiles had no clue. Don't you think? So the question was, what do we tell them they must keep? And it was four things. Remember the four things? Number one, don't eat the blood. Don't eat things offered to idols. Don't fornicate. And there was one other. What was the other one? Oh, don't eat things strangled. And then it says why those were important. Fornication, we can all kind of see that. Apparently the Gentiles in, the, in that region were big fornicators. <laughs> At least in that region. <clears throat> but then it says because, it, it tells why those things. Because Moses has in every city those who follow him. So the reason wasn't so that you could make sure you eat medium, well, well done meat. That wasn't the purpose. It was because in the Old Testament, the life was in the blood and the Jews were commanded not to eat the blood. And that was a violation of law. But because they have Jews in every city, those who follow Moses in every city, let's not do those things. That we don't want to cause them to stumble. They'll think that we're unholy if we do these things. Does that make sense? I mean, don't eat things strangled because it keeps the blood. And you're supposed to co eat kosher meat, which, which drains all the blood out. That's how Jews were commanded to live. Isn't that right? We can't keep those commands. Do you realize that? Do you, anybody eat at restaurants? You don't know how they, eat, they kill their food. They don't, you don't know how those, that meat got prepared for you. They could have strangled it, knocked it on the head. They certainly didn't drain it. So you can't be a better Christian by trying to keep some of those little commands. That make sense? So you wonder, well, why they tell them to tell those people that? I just told you. Just so that the Jews in the area don't think you're, you're unholy. Maybe you'll have a chance to lead them to Christ if they think that you're honoring God in your life. The stumbling block command supersedes almost everything. Sure, I could eat McDonald's hamburger. Sure, I can eat medium well, or medium, whatever I like, you know. I, I can eat that kind of food. But if there's a Jew at the table or an Indian at the table, I'm not eating steak. <laughs> I, I want to lead them to Christ. That's important to God. It's important that we don't take liberties that are okay between you and God, but not okay if people are stumbling. Romans chapter 10. We're almost done. Kind of wrap it up here. There's one scripture I owe you for some reason. I, I don't see it here. Whoever prepared my notes <laughs> skipped one somewhere. All right, Romans chapter 10. We've said these things before, I think, in the meeting one, but let's just cover them just to wrap it up so you feel real good about it all. Romans chapter 10, verse 4, for Christ... No, 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 we better read verse uh, 10, I mean verse 1. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Glory. Now, he didn't end the nine moral laws. But he did end the nine moral laws for righteousness. Amen. That means you can break all nine of the nine moral laws and still be righteous. We hate that command. Well, we hate that truth. We just, the Christians just don't like that truth. 
Maybe that's a little, little overdue. You can break one of the nine commandments. Feel okay about that? And still be righteous. <laughs> you need to know this and admit this. It'll help your life. You don't go in and out of righteousness. I get saved by faith and I'm righteous before God. I stumble in sin. I'm not unrighteous now. I'm still righteous because my righteousness was not dependent on my obedience. My righteousness was dependent only on my faith in Christ. I stumble. I, I, I sinned against one of the nine moral laws. And then I go another week and I, and I break all nine. I'm still righteous. Hallelujah. That's an amazing truth that you'll never understand without the Holy Spirit. It is the purpose of the cross and the blood. It was to clean you and make you righteous without your deeds. You don't get more right or righteous with good deeds. You don't get less righteous with bad deeds. Now, remember what Peter said? Jesus was washing their feet. This is a perfect example. Jesus was washing their feet. And Jesus said, I, I'm going to wash your feet. Peter said, oh, no, don't you wash my feet. You know, I'm not worthy. Of you. Let me wash your feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. G Peter said, oh, well, by all means, then I'll just wash your whole, you know, then wash my whole body. <laughs> Remember he said that? Then wash my whole body. Jesus said, no, he that is washed doesn't need to get rewashed. Just your feet. People think, oh, see, we're supposed to watch each other, wash each other's feet. Now put your New Testament Holy Ghost glasses on. That's not what he's talking about. Jesus wasn't talking about feet washing. He's talking about righteousness. And, and once you're saved, you are righteous. We don't ever have to rewash your body. You're righteous. But as you go through life, you're going to get your feet dirty. And you're going to need to get some forgiveness. And you're going to need to clean your feet and your conscience. So let Jesus clean your conscience. And if, and if you don't let him clean your conscience, you have no part with him. Amen. If you don't get forgiven, you have no part with him. Yeah. So obedience still matters. It just doesn't determine your righteousness. Right. Amen. Amen. It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting not so that you can go live flamboyantly. It's exciting because it frees you up and recognize, you recognize the love and the grace of God is so magnificent for us. Yeah. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. People say, well, see, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. We know there's a scripture that says that. But to fulfill it, yes, and he did. Amen. He's the only one that could. He's the only one that did. He didn't do it so you could fulfill it. He did it so you didn't have to fulfill it. Amen. He's the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. What does that mean? That means that if you think it's a sin to cut grass on Sundays, then don't you dare cut your grass on Sundays. If you're going to live by it, you better live by it. Otherwise, you'll feel guilty on Monday and then you'll separate yourself in fellowship from God in some way. Or your faith will get a little bit weaker. You'll go to pray for some simple thing or some big thing. God, and Je oh God, I'm so sorry I mowed the grass. What else did I do? Oh, I think I've done a whole lot of things. That's the reason to get some of this straight in you so that your confidence toward God and your closeness to God is not affected by something that's not even a law. Yes. Amen. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Glory. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, <laughs> it's so good, thanks God, thanks, thanks God. <laughs> this is a funny story, Galatians, I wasn't going to read it, but I, I, I skimmed upward, okay. Chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had came to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. 
But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Look at the, the conflict they were having, trying to get out of this Judaism cloak. Peter was a holy saint. He was an apostle filled. I mean, he was, in, he was entrusted with this gospel. And yet he was still torn between pleasing the followers of Moses. Not sure. So Paul just stood him up. <laughs> Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. so that Because, you know, in, in, the, in the law, you know what the law was? The law was that Jews could have nothing to do with Gentiles. Jews could not sit down and eat with Gentiles. Gentiles were unholy, called dogs. Verse 14, but when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? You can think about that in your own time. <laughs> Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Right. Yeah. No matter how good you try to obey the works of the law, you will never be justified. Verse 21 there says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. This one, it really gets, really gets serious. Now, you know, Galatians started by Paul saying this, saying, who has bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? Who has tricked you? You were saved in the spirit. Now you're going back to the law. Verse 21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. The King James says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. How frustrating is it for God who has sent His only Son to make us righteous and then we're trying to go back to law keeping for righteousness. That's frustrating. Mm -hmm. If righteousness comes by the law, Christ didn't need to die. It's not both. It's not Christ needed to die and we need the law. It's one or the other. Look at chapter 3 here. Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor. King James says schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So we're not under the tutor, which is the law, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, right? What is the law? First five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. I'll read you Romans, 20, uh, Romans 3, verse 21. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 13, we'll probably try to close here. Romans chapter 13. You there? Romans 13 here. Verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So if you're trying to be a law keeper, fine. Just love one another. And that's where all the nine moral laws are hanging. Remember this, what Jesus said? They asked him what the greatest commandment was. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he said, the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything hangs under the law of love. The, the, the law of love. Right? Now Sabbath isn't in there. 
Sabbath is not included. Can you see why? It has nothing to do with walking in love. Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, shall not covet. Notice he just, he skipped the fourth one. And if there's any other commandment, it's all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Glory. Pretty exciting, huh? Yeah. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web where you can now watch services via live streaming and find many other life-changing resources or download our Houston Faith phone app.